and welcome to this introduction to ACE, the virtual analogue modular synth from Yuhei. The name ACE is an acronym of Any Cable Everywhere. Like the classic analogue modulars that inspired it, ACE doesn't differentiate between audio signals and control signals. The LFOs can be used as oscillators, or the oscillators as LFOs. The filters can be patched to smooth out control signals, or they can self-oscillate and be used as an extra LFO. The multiples at the bottom can blend signals together or crossfade between them, or can be used for amplitude or ring modulation. And complex feedback paths are not only possible, they are positively encouraged. ACE is not afraid to improve on the analog paradigm where appropriate, however. We have a library of presets, for example, with the ability to tag favourites. And we can choose polyphonic mode to play chords, or stack up voices under a single key with true unison modes. We can also wire multiple cables from a single output, or colour code the cables, change the thickness and transparency, and of course, you can never run out of patch cables. Let's pick the initialize preset and notice that unlike a pure analog modular, we don't need to patch any cables to hear a basic sawtooth sound. With no cables connected, ACE defaults to a typical analog synth configuration capable of creating many classic sounds. Notice also that ACE defaults to polyphonic mode, so I can play more than one note at a time. However, if I play two notes an octave apart, we hear a little bit of movement between the two voices, as, like real analog oscillators, they don't quite stay perfectly in sync with each other. We can see this quite clearly if we turn down the frequency knob for the scope to zoom in on the waveform. This effect is optional, however. Turn off drift for a more digital style of oscillator that stays locked in sync. So, let's trace the default signal flow, working backwards and starting from the two VCA modules at the top. VCA2 has its volume knob turned all the way down, so we're only hearing the output of VCA1 at the moment. Just below the volume knob is an orange combo box, indicating that the VCA is linked to envelope 1. Let's slow the attack and release times, and drop the sustain level to create a soft pad type envelope shape. At the bottom of the VCA section we have an input jack. The label VCF1 indicates that, with no cable connected, this input defaults to the first of the two filter modules just below. As well as the usual cutoff and resonance controls, this module also provides a combo box to the right with options for one, two, or three pole low pass types, as well as the default four pole filter. And a gain pot to the left, which allows you to choose how hard you drive the filter model. If I crank this up, we see the sawtooth wave becomes more square in shape as the filter starts to saturate and distort. The bottom row of knobs allows the filter cutoff to be modulated by various sources. The right hand knob is permanently wired to key fold, so we can make the filter open wider for higher notes, or track the keyboard pitch one to one when turned all the way up. We also have a hardwired connection from LFO2. The LFO is set to sync mode, so is locked to the host tempo at whatever beat division I specify. Notice that the LFO2 modulation knob in the filter section is bi-directional, so I can invert the modulation by turning it the other way. And it also has an input jack underneath, so I can override the default routing and connect something else here instead. The knob to the left is identical and also modulates filter cutoff, the only difference being the default routing, this time from ADSR2. Let's set the attack slower than ADSR1, set the release about the same, and zero the sustain. Let's also turn up the velocity knob to the right, so that gentler notes don't open the filter as wide, 
and sound warmer as a result. The jack socket to the left is the main audio input to the filter. And as we can see from the label, this defaults to the output of the mixer, exactly as if there were a cable connecting them. The first knob in the mixer is bi-directional and crossfades between the two main oscillators. This is turned fully left, and all the other knobs are all the way down, so we're therefore hearing just the main output from oscillator 1. And sure enough, I can tune the sound in semitones, or fine-tune it in hundredths of a semitone. Can crossfade to a square wave instead of a sawtooth and can adjust the pulse width to create pulse waves instead of a square. Again, the lower two knobs control modulation. The left-hand knob modulates oscillator pitch and defaults to envelope 2 with no wires connected, while the right-hand knob modulates pulse width, with LFO2 as the default source. And the result is a rich sound similar to two detuned oscillators. OK, let's jump back to the start, turn VCA1 all the way down, and turn up VCA2 instead. We're back to a basic sawtooth shape, as we can see from the scope. But as VCA2 is linked to the same envelope as VCA1, we still have the same volume envelope. So VCA2's input jack defaults to the second filter, VCF2. And sure enough, I can warm up the sound by turning the cutoff knob down. Filter 2 uses the same algorithms as filter 1, so if I match the settings, it should sound the same. But notice that, unlike filter 1, the cutoff knob is bi directional, and the label underneath is in a combo box indicating it's actually a menu. Clicking this switches filter 2 to offset mode so it tracks filter 1 with whatever offset we specify. I'll set a zero offset so the two filters match exactly. And let's look at the input signal, which defaults to a direct connection from oscillator 2. The two oscillators obviously aren't exactly the same, with different control options for each. But oscillator 2 also has a pair of tuning controls. It can be cross-faded to a square or pulse wave, and can be pulse width modulated from LFO2. So we now have the same sound that we created with oscillator 1 and filter 1. I'm going to do one thing slightly differently, however, and turn on the reset parameter for oscillator 2. So the oscillator restarts for each new note. Oscillator 1 has reset turned off, so it's running freely like an analog oscillator. And this creates phase differences between the two oscillators. So if I mix them together by turning up both VCAs, the sound gets more complex rather than just louder. And if I pan the two VCAs in opposite directions, the differences between the two signals creates a wide pseudo-stereo effect. I can increase these differences by tuning the oscillators a few cents apart from each other. But notice the orange combo boxes under the fine tuning knobs indicating that we can change the mode. Detuning the waves in hertz instead of cents means the beating between the oscillators remains at the same speed regardless of the note I play. And this can help to create a sound that works well over a wider range of the keyboard. I can also add keyboard tracking for the amplitude envelope for similar reasons. Notice the knob marked level under the velocity knob with three dots underneath indicating it is currently unassigned. I'll right click, assign it to key follow, and turn the knob down to make lower notes sound louder than higher notes. OK, let's take a closer look at LFO2, which is modulating the pulse width of both oscillators. The LFO has a level control, which I can use to adjust the modulation depth for both oscillators at once. And the LFO is still set to sync mode, so is locked to the host tempo. For traditional pulse width modulation type sounds, it might be better to switch to Hertz instead. 
and dial in a constant modulation speed that doesn't depend on the project tempo. The upper end of the scale in Hertz mode is 24 Hertz, just creeping into the audio range. But notice the knob to the right is set to multiply. Turning this up puts the LFO firmly in the audio range, and the result is no longer a traditional pulse width modulation effect, but rather a completely new waveform. Actually, strictly speaking, a new waveform for each note, as the LFO, or as I should probably now call it, the modulating oscillator, is fixed to a constant frequency. So the frequency ratio between this oscillator and the main oscillators depends on the pitch of the note I play. However, the LFO tuning knobs provide all the same options as the main oscillators. So let's set the first knob to semitones. The LFO now tracks keyboard pitch just like the main oscillators. And I can obtain a range of interesting new harmonic timbres by tuning the LFO to musical intervals like a perfect fifth or an octave. Of course, the resulting timbre also depends on the modulation depth. Let's turn the LFO level all the way down so we're back to pure square waves. And turn up the modulation knob below instead, which we can see is hardwired to ADSR2. And we now have more movement in the sound. And the deepest pulse width modulation happens when the filter is open widest, creating a brassy rasp. There's another modulation knob over to the left, this time with a scale option below it, just like those for the main oscillators. But unlike the other inputs we've looked at so far, this one has no default routing, so we'll have to explicitly wire something to it. I'm going to pick pressure at the bottom, which provides both channel pressure and polyphonic aftertouch. Left click and drag a connection to the LFO pitch modulation pin, then set the knob to plus seven, so pressing harder on a key tunes the LFO up a fifth. I want to add some rhythmic modulation to the sound now. So I'll drag a wire from the LFO1 output pin to the second modulation pin for filter 1 to override the default connection. Remember that filter 2 is set to offset mode. So when I turn up the modulation depth knob, I'm actually modulating both filters. And let's set the LFO1 sync value to 16 for 16th note tempo synced modulation. I can now adjust modulation depth using either the LFO level knob or with the modulation depth knob in the filter section. But as the modulation knob is bi-directional, turning this the other way instead will invert the modulation. As a final touch, let's turn the LFO1 level knob all the way down and turn up its modulation knob instead, which we can see is hardwired to the mod wheel. So I can now control the modulation while playing, or program it in after the fact. And let's also add a touch of tempo synced delay from the effects section in the top right corner. The effects section also offers a range of chorus effects, or a phaser. But more dramatic chorusing type effects can be created using the stack parameter over to the left. This provides a true unison option, so each note triggers multiple voices with subtle tuning differences between them. But of course, with higher values, you will use up the available voices quickly. So you may also need to change the voices parameter from medium to many to play full chords. Obviously, this will also increase the processor load. So ACE allows you to change the quality setting and trade off a small amount of quality in exchange for lower CPU use. That's all I've got time for in this video. Don't forget to look for part two, which will walk you through creating a monophonic lead patch with oscillator sync, delayed vibrato, and a parallel filter configuration. Thanks for watching.